Hey, thanks for tuning in to The Art of SBA Lending. I am very excited about our guest today. This is someone I've wanted to interview on here since the very first time I had the idea to do this podcast. He has started multiple companies, numerous TV appearances, publications, published author, testified before Congress, and now he's here with us. So please welcome Chris Hearn, founder and CEO of Fountainhead. Hey, Chris, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Ray. All right, so people may not know this, but you gave me my first job out of college. And if you hadn't done that, there's a 0% chance I would have made it into the SBA lending industry. So if you're listening to this, you can thank Chris. And I want to thank Chris because of this career, I've been able to make a name for myself. I've been able to achieve financial freedom, bought my mom a house, bought my dream car. And you know, I most importantly wake up every day doing what I love, which a lot of people don't get to do. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, in fact, you've given a lot of successful people their start. You know, in fact, some people have been saying you're like the Lauren Michaels of SBA okay. lending in a way. Um, uh, I do about that, but okay. <laughs> now, I would think that you'd be super proud of that. Um, or are you more bitter because, you know, you foster this great talent and then they move on to a new opportunity and then you got to kind of find the next guy? No, I'm not. I'm not bitter about it. I understand why, why you're asking the question. Um, no, I mean, I, I have, it's, it's been, uh, it's been very humbling and, and exciting to, to watch a number of the folks that started with me, um, oftentimes as interns like yourself, um, and then they blossomed. I think that's exciting. I mean, I could name four or five people off the top of my head who, who have done this, uh, not always made a name for themselves in the SBA world, but actually have gone on and, and made a name for themselves in you know, middle market banking or become entrepreneurs themselves. I, I think it's great. And I think, uh, I think that's helpful. I might have answered this question differently 15 or 20 years ago, Ray, but I, I think I'm, I'm ever evolving and, and have matured a little bit about this. Um, so, but on the other hand, I still like to hire young people to come in to train them up my way. Um, I don't particularly like to bring in folks from another financial institution because sometimes it doesn't mean I won't, because I, I certainly have done that many times, but I don't necessarily like to bring people over, you know, with their, with their old baggage and their old habits and things like that. I, I, I prefer to start them fresh. And that's why I've even hired people from outside the industry. And I've got a, you know, I've got a great team. I've got the best team I've ever had. It's very exciting. A lot of these folks have started at the bottom and, and risen, and I like to do that. Um, I think it's a lot of fun to, uh, to, to train people, to, to coach and mentor them and, and get them to a place uh, that they can be exceptional in what they do. And, and if that means they're staying with me, that's great. And if it means they have to move on, well, then I hope they'll say nice things about us. And, uh, and I've actually had some of these people bend boomerangs and they come back to us as well because they, you know, the grass isn't always greener somewhere else. So, right. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you do think it's still possible to nurture this new talent. So like if you're interviewing someone and they're coming without SBA experience, what is it that you are looking for when you're having that initial discussion for them to try to figure out if they're going to be a fit? Well, first of all, I a hundred percent believe it's possible because I do it all the time. Um, I think the biggest thing I look for is a great attitude, is coachability, and, and obviously smarts. Doesn't mean you have to be a genius, doesn't even mean you have to have a college degree, um, but you have to have a great attitude and you got to be coachable. You got to be willing to put in the effort and, and learn from your mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, you just have to learn from them. So if, if people fit that formula and they're comfortable with, with math, obviously with finance, um, then they'll probably have a good shot with us. Uh, yeah, I mean, you don't even need math these days. I mean, it's all spreadsheets, right? Well, huh. yes, you have to at least know how to do spreadsheets. And, and, you know, I can tell you, I still don't quite know what a pivot table is, but, you know, I, I have, I have people under me who know what that stuff yeah, is. You're not alone. All right. <laughs> so did you have a mentor? Get, how did you get into the SBA space? Um, I got in, I, I was in sales and marketing in um, the Washington, D.C. area, right out of grad school before and, and I worked for um, some high-tech startups up there uh, before that became trendy. 
and uh, had a lot of success. And then some recruiters came calling and um, they represented GE Capital, which um, you know I had gone to grad school, got my degree, um, and thought it made a lot of sense to get into finance. And so they gave me an opportunity and uh, I started working for them. I only lasted about six months in the DC area. Before, oh, wow. Well, cause I, I guess I showed, you know, my worth and they said, well, we, we have some openings in some other places around the country. We've got, you know, you've got your choice. Would you like to move to, we, we will move you. We'll, it's a corporate relo. Um, we'll move you to Denver, Charlotte or Orlando. So Charlotte was really not an option for me because I, I thought Charlotte was a sleepy town. This is going back 23 years ago, 23 and a half years ago. Um, Denver was nice. I still like Denver. And actually the Fountainhead, our second office is in Denver. Um, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a Midwesterner originally. And, and I took a couple vacations when I was a child. And one of them was driving down here to Orlando. And uh, I fell in love with the place. I, I like to think of myself as an enlightened Midwesterner. You know, I got out of the Midwest because I wanted to go to a better climate. And it helps that, you know, we don't have state income tax down here, but that's really what it was. And I like the newness of Orlando. You know, Orlando wasn't much 50 years ago prior to Disney coming to town. So everything's relatively new here. And I find that kind of exciting and, uh, you know, it just energizes me. And so, We've put down roots. We've been here over 23 years, uh, you know, raised a family here. I know you've been back to D.C. since because you've actually testified in front of Congress on the SBA programs multiple times, right? Yeah. How do you prepare for something like that? <laughs> well, the first time you do it, it's a bit nerve wracking. And so it's kind of like studying for a college final, I guess, which is, you know, you're, at least what I did is I was going through, you know, talking points and making sure I, I knew what I would say. Um, I don't know that necessarily that's the best method to prepare, because frankly, if you're going to be invited to testify in front of a congressional committee, you ought to know your stuff, number one, and you should probably be conversational about it, you know, which I know a lot of people go into those with a carefully prepared script that they're reading from. We've all seen it on C-SPAN. It's it just, you know, it's kind of dry and boring. These are real people, too, and I think they appreciate when you can have a conversation with them you can, you know, speak off the top of your head about these things, which not everybody can. I understand that. But but that's what I think makes a good congressional testimony, not the people reading from the, you know, their notes and stuff. But uh, that's yeah. what I do. Um, yeah, I go up to D.C. You know, Pre-pandemic, I was up there about every other month. I've gotten to know a lot of folks on, on Capitol Hill and obviously in the agency and speak with them regularly spoken to several this week on the on committee staff so on various things but yeah it's um i don't particularly i don't find it necessarily exciting to do because you know the problem is whatever we're trying to represent from the small business industry um, we have to understand they've literally got thousands of other competing interests that they're hearing from every day from all these people and so it, it can be a little tough to to kind of break through and, and really get them to focus on our priorities but um so that's why i'm not as fond of it as as maybe i thought it was 10 15 years ago but it's it's okay i mean it's a sort of a necessary evil you know you've got to let them know what's going on what works what doesn't what improvements uh you think that should happen and and uh, make sure they understand it because we're on the front lines and they're not so um you know it's a necessary evil for sure right yeah, that's why I call it the room where nothing happens for all the Hamilton fans out there. You started as a BDO in at GE, but you've gone on to, you really went out and forged your own path in this industry. So uh, you've started multiple non-bank lenders. Um, there's 14 non-bank 7A licenses. 504 is a little different, but most SBA lending is done you know, through banks. Right. I'm curious, how do you start a non-bank lending institution? Well, um, well, let me let me finish sort of my trajectory. So I was at GE for almost three years, and then again, recruiters came calling this time for Heller Financial. Um, so I decided they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I joined Heller, still here in Orlando, and then um, about a year later, GE purchased Heller. So I was back to GE, and I, I kind of joked back then that you know all they had to do was was uh, remove the the salary cap, which is what they had, actually, if you, you earned up to a certain level, even as a BDO, uh, commissions included, 
they capped you out and then would give you options above that. And I said, well, gee, all you had to do was get rid of that. You could have had me continue to have me. You didn't have to spend billions to get Heller. <laughs> um, so, but uh, so then I was at Heller for a little while. Um, ultimately, I left because I, I got a little frustrated with the GE and the Heller underwriting process, quite frankly, um, which was, and this is unfortunately, this is the case. I'm sure a lot of your, your listeners, your viewers can, can appreciate this, can sympathize with this, which is, you know, a lot of these folks, they're very, very concerned about concentrations. And so, you know, maybe daycares is an industry we're going to focus on today, but if you get too many, then eventually they're going to be like, okay, we need to put the brakes on the daycare deal flow. Um, and th- what it causes is these ebbs and flows, you know, there's these waves up and down about, you know, what, what we're willing to see. And, and I just saw too many transactions get turned down because of concentration limits or, well, we have enough hotels right now. We have enough restaurants. We have enough of this or that or whatever. And I found that a little frustrating. So ultimately I ended up leaving, um, joined uh, Marsha McLennan, um, which is a large insurance company, um, to do similar things in the, using insurance capital for, uh, for businesses. And that, that worked for a little while. Unfortunately, Marsh got um, devastated by 9-11. Um, they, they lost the second most number of people um, to Cantor Fitzgerald. And uh, oh, wow. yeah, it was just never quite the same after that. So in the middle of all that, I, I you know, had, had left lending for, for a year and a half or so. And I had a conversation with a, a buddy of mine over a beer at a bar and uh, he it's ran. How they all, it's all it all starts. Yeah. Every story yeah. starts with that. Exactly. Um, he, he ran a large CDC and he, he basically said, what, what can we do to pull you back in, you know, back into lending? Cause you were, you were good. You did a, you did a great job. And I think you have a, a great future here. And, and I said, well, let me think about it. Um, then I was a management consultant for about a year and a half and enjoyed that, but it was way too much travel. And this was right after 9-11. So travel was just ridiculous. Some of the things you had to do. Um, but eventually I said, you know, I kind of formulated this idea. If I'm going to do this, I need to do it myself. You know, I'm, I'm the only person probably who could try to smooth out those ebbs and flows, um, at least from a credit standpoint, which always bothered me. So um, you know, I partnered with a friend and we launched my old company um, in fall of 20, 2002. So you can see how close this was to, to 9-11. Um, we launched it. We thought we were only going to be in Florida, in central Florida, actually. And within months, we were in Flo- all over Florida. And within a few more months, we were starting to do deals outside of Florida which was never on the horizon. We, we hadn't thought, I hadn't learned that concept of really thinking big at that point. So, um, mm. so we started moving on. We, we were obviously we raised some money um, from some sort of friends and family types, uh, folks that we had invested in some real estate deals with um, who were interested in this. And keep in mind, my old company was really one of the first um, non-bank lenders to focus, highly focus on a, an SBA product. In this case, it was the 504. And so, um, you know, that, that worked out pretty well for us. And we, we grew extremely fast. We, uh, you know, I, I got on the Inc. 500 list three years in a row with that company um, because of our, our torrent growth. And, um, you know, and at some point near the end of that, that's when, that's when you, you uh, decided to come work for us as an intern to start and then obviously full time after that. But we, uh, it worked pretty well. And then we ran into the last recession, the Great Recession. And um, that was mm-hmm. unfortunate. Um, we, you know, what we did was very low risk from, from a credit standpoint. But, you know, we had, as a non-bank lender, we had our own source of capital, but we also relied on lines of credit to fund our loans. And unfortunately, at that time, um, you know, the, the lending community, the finance community in general just seized up and had all sorts of issues. And um, we, had, we had four different lines of credit, two of them completely shut down. I mean, within, within months, because nothing that we had done, but because they had issues and they'd made some poor decisions in other areas of the bank that caused a ripple effect. And so um, when that occurred, it was just kind of the writing was on the wall. It was going to be a struggle to continue operating as a non-bank lender at that time. So our second largest line lender 
um, approached us and had a conversation about, hey, we, you know, you guys have done a great job. We'd love to bring you in house. Um, you know, we'd love to have an SBA division, and nobody does it better than you guys. And you know, the markets are a mess right now. Have you ever thought about joining up with us? And so we kind of kicked that around. It wasn't really a distressed sale, but there was there was definitely a little bit of pressure to make something happen. And so um, ultimately, that's what we did. We sold ourselves to a community bank here in town. And uh, I stuck around for almost four years, which amazes most of my friends that I actually could tolerate that. Um, but, you know, it, they kind of left us alone for the first couple of years. And then they got, um, you know, I likened it to, they, they sort of did some window dressing, you know, and what they were doing was preparing themselves for a sale to a larger institution, which ultimately happened. And uh, near the end, I, uh, I approached the, um, the father and son team that ran the bank and said, how about I buy my baby back from you guys? And I already had the financing lined up to do that. And they kind of drugged their feet a little bit, you know, didn't quite shoot straight with me. And what I found out later is because they were negotiating with multiple other parties to sell the overall bank. Um, they didn't really want to carve off a piece of it. They wanted to keep everything together. And uh, ultimately they did that. I ended up deciding to leave and um, gratifyingly, I launched Fountainhead just under six months later, about a month and a half before they finalized the sale of the bank to a larger bank. So uh, wow. I kind of think that's humorous in some ways, but uh, in that you know, intervening time, I obviously I, I raised some more funds, um, got a line of credit put in place, and I've just kind of grown from there. So yeah. that's, that's a quick, you know, overview of how I got to this place. No, it's, it's a great story. And the whole reason you had the vision for it in the first place was because you wanted to solve these problems that, you know, a lot of small business owners would um, face going to a bank saying, well, we've, we've done too much of this. We've done too much of that. And they put these restrictions in, not all of them always make sense. And now um, because, you know, 2008, you're kind of having to, in a way, answer to right. some of that same mentality, which probably is where your why your friends were so shocked. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And well, now, you know, yeah. traditionally, banks can be um, very conservative is what people will say. But what that means is they, they can be a bit, they can be a bit dogmatic, they can be very risk averse. Um, you know, the people that are often making the decisions are making it based on their experience, oftentimes over decades, some of which is bad experience, which of course colors their view on things. And it just, um, and I know we have this in all industries, all businesses, um, but when you're, you're in an SBA department or a division of, of your institution, um, you know, it's not just about the profits of that division, it's also about trying to help small business owners. And, and what we do as an industry makes a huge impact on these people's lives. So um, because you're getting government guarantees on these loans, I, I've always been of the view that, you know, you should be a little broader in your credit box. You, you know, you should be willing to take on the deals that um, don't necessarily, would never fit conventionally. And I'm not saying we make bad credit decisions. I'm just saying there's other considerations that go into play there. And um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just a, it's an interesting dynamic little niche that we all live in. And uh, not everybody understands that at a lot of traditional banks and, and, and they get frustrated. You know? Yeah. And it's funny because y your company Fountainhead, which is also the title of an Ayn Rand novel, right? Yeah. And, the, that's, and the protagonist there is battling against conventional wisdom and doesn't want to conform to an establishment who's unwilling to accept innovation. That's right. So how does that tie into small business lending? You're talking about the name? Well, you that's you named it off of off of that, right? You well, sort of. I mean, I, like where's the, the name come from? Just tell me the, the origin uh, of the name, why you picked it. Yeah. So you're you're partly right. And I'm I'm impressed at uh, how much you've you've read apparently on this. Um, the name, if you look up a fountainhead in the dictionary online, you'll find that a fountainhead is defined as something where it's a, it's a source from which things spring. So like, you know, a, a river oftentimes will spring from a fountainhead. 
uh, or we've all seen in like somebody's um, you know backyard they've got like a little lion head concrete lion head that has water spraying through its mouth those are called fountain heads so I thought it was a good metaphor for um, for a capital provider to be a source from which capital springs but um, yeah kind of like in an outburger the secret menu the secret menu in here is is what you just said which is yeah I'm I've been an Ayn Rand fan for a long time I'm certainly not an objectivist. I think she got a lot of things right. There's other things she didn't get right. But probably my favorite novel of hers is The Fountainhead. And, and uh, it oftentimes resonates with business owners because the business owners, um, you know, have defied convention if they've gone out on their own. You know, they have struggled against, you know, whether it's bureaucracy or large corporations or what have you. It oftentimes is the sole entrepreneur against all these obstacles. And so I figured it would resonate and it has. I mean, it's, I can't tell you how many times, Ray, that I've heard from a business owner who just kind of chuckles and says, no, I, I want to work with you guys because I, I like the name and I know what it means. And, and I want to, I want to work with you guys. So, which is good. It's gratifying. Lending and especially like government guaranteed lending. It's so hard to break out and do your, and, and forge your own path like you've done. I mean, it's such a everyone has the same kind of business plan or playbook that they're playing from, it seems. And you just do things different. I mean, most nationwide SBA lenders subscribe to the BDO model. For example, right. they hire BDOs in various markets throughout the country, and that's the majority of their go-to-market strategy. And right. you don't really have BDOs. Why, no. why is that? What's, can you explain your go-to-market strategy? <laughs> sure, which, <laughs> which annoys some people, I, I'm afraid. Um, and it's not meant to annoy anybody, but... Yeah, I when I started out my old company, um, I had a BDO a couple different times, and I just felt like it didn't work that well. You know, not everybody has, you know, the fire in the belly like you do, Ray. So, um, you know, some BDOs tend to, you know, they're salespeople at the end of the day, right? And the and the problem, the knock on salespeople oftentimes is that, um, you know, a they talk too much, they don't listen as much as they should, and b they probably don't work as hard as a lot of folks in other areas of the business. And what I mean by that is oftentimes, you know, salespeople have a yearly quota, for instance. And if they've hit their yearly quota, there isn't always necessarily the rational reason to blow it out of the water, to, you know, go way past your quota, or your, your annual, um, you know, volume target. Because we all know what will happen the following year, which is, okay, then now that's your, you know, now we're going to use that as your baseline and add, you know, a percentage above it for your next year. And so all that does under that scenario is it makes a lot of people sort of, you know, shut it down, or, you know, go to, you know, go from fourth or fifth gear down to one, first gear um, to finish out a year. And I always thought that was kind of dumb. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I don't want to be that guy who, you know, over micromanages and distrusts his employees. And so I, I didn't want to develop that dynamic. So I didn't think it was the best model. I oftentimes in, in business, you know, if everybody's going one way, I oftentimes go the other way. I think that's one way you can stand out is, is kind of defy con conventional wisdom. And so um, I decided to put, you know, the capital that I would have spent on hiring a fleet of BDOs of salespeople, you know, oftentimes with some pretty good fixed costs. And I decided to put that towards marketing and public relations. And um, what that what that allowed us to do is, you know, financial services is particularly going back 20 some years is is uh, notoriously an industry where we're marked. They're not very good at marketing. OK, number one, 100 uh, percent. Yeah. And they're also not terribly great at sales. Now, there's obviously there's exceptions to this, but a lot of banks, I mean, part of what they do is, you know, they're, they want to sell you everything because they're getting little fees from all sorts of different products and services. So that's great. It's a decent business model, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be as driven in certain other areas to constantly produce new business. Sometimes they're just going to sort of rest on their laurels with what they've got. And so I find that having an inside sales model, which is what we have, um, as opposed to an external sales model, has worked very well for us over the years. And um, you know, it keeps our fixed costs down. I certainly incentivize our inside salespeople 
very similar to what BDOs would be incentivized with. But um, I think it gives us a better level of, uh, of uh, execution. I think it gives us better level of quality control. Um, you know, I don't, you know, sort of second guess our people that like, you know, they decided to go to the golf club at three o'clock in the afternoon after they arrived at, you know, 930 that morning, which of course has been the historical knock on bankers. Um, so, you know, I just, I just think it works well for us, um, probably could work well for others. Um, uh, although I know that a lot of others out there don't want to test this and, and I don't blame them in some way, right. you know, but, uh, yeah, that's what we do and it works pretty well for us. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't see us really uh, going back to, you know, the traditional way that I see a lot of others out there do. No, I mean, I agree. And I'm shocked that so many lenders still use this BDO model because you've been doing it with in-house, you know, for a while. And, um, you know, you've been you know, probably the first, maybe the, I don't know, one of the only to adopt that strategy. But um, now what BDOs often are doing is going out to market with marketing on LinkedIn at conferences and the versus, you know, making strong ties in their backyard, you know, building relationships with people in their backyard. They're basically just doing what a company could be doing and getting paid very handsomely for it. And at some point I would think a bank or a lending company realizes, you know, we're paying BDOs, all this money in all these different markets around the country, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all going to LinkedIn, they're marketing, they're doing this and that, and all their deals are all around the country. And we could probably just train some younger talent to handle some of this intake and save a lot of money. One I don't know why it's not that prevalent right now. Well, cause I think it's, it's uh, for a lot of folks, it's, it's, again, it goes back to defying conventional wisdom, right? It's, it would be defying the norms what they're used to, you know, it's a little bit of an admission that maybe the old way is not working as well as it used to. I mean, look, you know this, banks are oftentimes um, geographically restricted. You know, they've got a footprint that they can operate in. So if that's the scenario and you're a community bank um, with a small footprint, then maybe it does make sense for your commercial loan officers um, to be out there, you know, working that smaller market. But yeah, as you say, there's a lot of national small business lenders um, that aren't necessarily working their own backyard. They, ha they have a reach outside of their area. And for them, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a head scratcher that they don't try a slightly different model. Um, at least try it and see what happens. But um, I don't know. Yeah. You said there's 14 SBLCs. We're one of them. There's only eight of us that are for profit. So the other six non-for-profits, I'm not sure that they're really make much of a dent annually in the, um, you know, the SBA origination rankings and stuff. So yeah, you, you secured that, um, that license, uh, what was that, 2019? Yeah, we, um, we started the process. I, I launched Fountainhead in February of 2015. We started that process to get the 7A license in, uh, I'm trying to think. I think it, it takes was a fall. while. Yeah, it, take, it takes a while. I think it was fall of 2017. And um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't get approved until, formally approved. And by the way, I, I wanted to buy a license that was separate from the portfolio, which that mm. probably added a few months to the process. Um, had to find somebody who's willing to sell it because they haven't issued a new one of these licenses in, in you know, almost 40 years. Um, so I had to find somebody who was willing to sell it. And I had to find somebody who was willing to separate the portfolio from the license because I didn't want to inherit someone else's skeletons. You know, they had done their underwriting. Maybe it's not at the level that ours was. So I just didn't want to take that right. risk. So, so I got through this. It's a, it's a bit of a gauntlet to run with SBA to get approved to buy one of these licenses as it should be. Um, and, uh, yeah, we got approved in December of 2019, three days before the government shut down. <laughs> so, mm. um, we didn't actually, er, sorry, December of 18, sorry. And then, uh, the government shut down and we ultimately launched the division and announced it in late February of 2019. Once, um, you know, the government was back up and, uh, and we felt it was time to, to tell everybody about it. Of course, we didn't, we just, um, 
we barely had a year under our belt, obviously, from February of 2019 to February of 2020 before the pandemic. Well, hit. that's what I was going to say, because then COVID happened and, and right. you know, the, the governments now it's they're talking about shutting down the country. And right. it was apparent that this pandemic was going to be bad. A lot yeah. of uncertainty last year. And you're a business owner. Employees rely on you. You're also a small business lender with a portfolio. Right. You know, business can't pay back their loans if they're not open. So when, you know, whatever your plans were going to be, March, 2020, they changed. So oh, what were you thinking once you realized that? Yeah. What I was thinking was, um, <laughs> gee, couldn't, couldn't this have happened a couple of years from now? Um, so we get a little bit more traction under, you know, cause we were, we were off to the races. I mean, we had a great fourth quarter of uh, 2019. We were off to our best year ever, our best January and February ever, you know, the pipeline was building, you know, closings were happening at, at a level above our, what we projected. Mm -hmm. um, and then it happened. And, you know, I, I distinctly remember um, one night in March, I think it was like March 8th or 9th, uh, the, the president had a, uh, you know, prime time speech from the White House. And he mentioned SBA in the speech. And that actually not only mentioned it, he actually said that he was going to um, authorize $50 billion of additional SBA funds to support the small business community, which I about fell off my couch. I remember this. Yeah. Because I don't know that I've ever heard, I've been doing this over 20 years. I don't think I've ever heard a president talk about the SBA in an Oval Office speech. So Right. I was a bit shocked and 50 billion. I mean, that's almost double the best year that SBA's ever had, you know? Um, so I just knew that at that moment, we would, this was sort of maybe even a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to really step up our game, pivot the business fully to do this um, mm -hmm. because we were needed, you know? I mean, it's, um, it's not every day that you get to, you know, be on the economic front lines and literally save people's business lives and, and keep right. people employed. And, and that's, that was the, uh, I viewed it as that was the call that went out and um, we were excited to be a part of that. And of course, I also started immediately working with my contacts on Capitol Hill about the legislation that was going to be forthcoming. Um, of course, by the next week, that 50 billion had gone up to 200 billion. The week after it was at 250. Um, when all said and done, you know, we all know that it was almost 800 billion that was poured through PPP and through private sectors like us. Um, but yeah, we pivoted the whole business because that's what was needed. And, uh, and frankly, if, if, you, if you weren't a PLP designated SBA at that point, it was going to be really tough to do 7A loans or 504 loans for that matter, because SBA was so distracted in this. They, you know, it was, it was, they basically told the lending community, look, we're, our focus is going to be on PPP for, for the foreseeable future. So good luck. If you want to do the other stuff, you know, that's your call, but we're going to pretty much put our time and resources solely on PPP. And um, so that's what they did. And so, yeah, of uh, pretty much from March 8th or 9th forward until Mother's Day, I worked seven days a week. Um, I often average 15, 16 hour days. Uh, it was ridiculous what we were what we were going through. I know a lot of others in the industry have had similar experiences. Um, you know, I slept in my office, I think five or six nights. Um, you know, my day would be, you know, literally working, hardcore working on the computer from seven in the morning till 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, which is not sustainable long term, obviously. But, um, you know, it was just the evolving regulations didn't help, as we all know. Um, you know, I got involved in that as well, um, was giving suggestions to SBA, to Treasury, to White House, um, you know, continuing to talk with folks on Capitol Hill, really ramping up our efforts to make sure that the business community was aware of this, what was coming. And, um, you know, it was just, you know, it was kind of, I don't, I don't want to cheapen analogy to wartime, but it was kind of like that in some ways, you know, economic war. And, and we really mobilized. And uh, at one point last year, we had more contract employees helping us in certain areas than we had full-time employees. And, um, you know, it wasn't until last fall that we really 
we're able to have the time to to slowly get back to regular business. Um, and we did. And then, uh, of course, the challenge for this year has been, you know, with with the CARES Act passing in late December of last year, which enabled the PPP loans this year, um, we also got all the credit enhancements, all, all the uh, enhancements on regular SBA loans. So, you know, all of us were exhausted having just, you know, literally pushed this monumental boulder up the hill. And now, we get to the other side now. The boulder is coming back at us because now we got to do round three of PPP. Plus, we're supposed to do, uh, you know, all these enhanced SBA programs with fees being waived and you know and debt relief and all these other things. So it's, you know, I don't need to tell you, Ray, or the rest of the folks that are listening or watching, but it's it's been the craziest time ever in business. Oh, let for alone, sure. Yeah, let alone the craziest time in the SBA world. And we've all worked our asses off. Um, for a year and a half now. And I know there's a lot of burnout and, and other things throughout the industry. Um, but we just, I just keep coming back and I keep reminding my team, look, look at what we did. Look what we accomplished. Look what we helped. Um, you know, I've, we've literally got thousands of online reviews and, and hundreds and hundreds of testimonials and letters that were sent to us about people who, who believe we really saved their business and, and saved, um, you know, kept food on the table for their employees and whatnot. So that's a, that's a really powerful thing to be able to earn a living, make some money, and at the same time have such a huge, powerful impact on people's lives like we have. What about the long-term impacts of, of all the stuff that's been going down? I mean, you have technology coming to the forefront in our industry. You got a ton of liquidity going, you know, flooding the streets. Banks, fintechs who never dealt with SBA before now coming to the table. Did COVID change the trajectory of the SBA lending programs? I think it did. I, I don't think we're ever going to go back uh, in many ways. Fintechs, um, I think they have a role to play. I'm, I'm not ready to say that fintechs should be able to jump into the SBA world right away. In fact, I'm, I'm obviously not supportive of that. Um, most of these guys couldn't spell SBA before the pandemic, so... Uh, they've never, most of them are technologists first, lenders second, and that causes some problems, as we can all imagine. Um, but I think there's a role to play of fintechs partnering with, with lenders, SBA lenders. Um, but I don't think we're, I don't think we're quite there yet with, with all of the technological enhancements that maybe a fintech could do for a consumer loan or a, an MCA. I don't think that's quite there yet for SBA. I think we're headed in that direction and there's been some serious improvements technologically speaking over the last few years, including some of the stuff we've done and I imagine you guys have done and some others. But, um, you know, we still got a ways to go. I, I think going forward, now that we've had three rounds of PPP, the, the next time we have, you know, a pandemic, God forbid, or, or something else like that, um, you know, that's going to be the go-to model it's you know they're going to take it down off the shelf and say here you go guys let's let's go um which is you know both concerning to me as well as maybe exciting but you know i'm not i'm not eager to do round four let's put it that way um you know sba stepped up tremendously over the last year and a half i, I can't emphasize that enough I'm, I'm very very proud of them you know this is a this is a federal bureaucracy that has been um you know, starved for funding for as long as I've been doing SBA lending. Um, you know, everybody wants to jack around with the SBA's annual budget. They don't jack around much with DOD's annual budget or some other <laughs> agencies, but they always seem to do it for SBA. And what's that, what's that produced? I mean, um, you know, I don't think they've historically had the, the IT infrastructure that they need. And, and we saw some of that last year with PPP with some of the issues with ETRAN. Um, they've improved some of it. Some, uh, they've had some contractors helping with some of these things. Um, but, you know, I, I think given the constraints that SBA had uh, coming into the pandemic, I mean, I really think they, they just shined brightly. I mean, they, they, the spotlight was on them. They did amazing things. They worked their asses off just like us in the lending community. Um, they're exhausted. They're burned out just like we all are. Um, but I don't think we're ever going to go back, Ray. I think... Uh, I think SBA, hopefully, the perception of SBA has changed radically as a result of all this. And I know it's easy to focus on, 
you know, the fraudsters and could, could we have done more, you know, should we have had, you know, should we have had tax transcripts, for instance, on a PPP loan? Well, you know what, you and I both know that would have cut out 99% of a lot of the fraud that, that we saw or, or that maybe got through. Um, you know, the shuttered venue program was a mess when it rolled out. I mean, I think it's easy for some people to focus on some of the, some of the failures or, or the, the stumbling that, that SBA had, but on in whole, I mean, you know, I think they really did an amazing job, and uh, and I hope others throughout uh, throughout Washington and um, the small business community will will think more highly of SBA going forward. You know, I've been doing this long enough where SBA used to be thought of as a lender of last resort, and I don't think right. that's the case anymore. Um, you know, some of the terms and conditions on an SBA loan are exceptional compared to conventional, ordinary conventional financing. And uh, that's, that's resonating better than it ever has. Um, and, you know, SBA, SBA programs saved a lot of people's butts over the last year and a half. And I think they're going to be um, much more willing to work, uh, to, to work with SBA lenders or to consider SBA loan programs going forward. So I think it's exciting. I think, I think our best days are ahead of us in many ways. I agree. I think SBA has been elevated. I think it's in the spotlight now. And I think everyone overall is happy and, and realizes, you know, this could have gone a lot worse. I mean, you, you, yes. you, you, we propped up this program seemingly overnight, That's all right. the lenders, banks, fintechs, everyone stepped up, you know, folks could have easily said, I don't want to get involved in this, but you had to get involved with it. You had, it was, and it was really ugly at the beginning. And our, the whole concern was we just need to get money out the door. Right. No one was, talking about fraud or this or that. I mean, if we had, we were talking about if we can't get this loan funded in a week, you know, this business is going to be shut down or they're going to go bankrupt or this or that. I mean, the, I feel like it was so urgent and to, yeah. you, you just had to make, you know, balance that you couldn't put too much red tape in it or it would have been too late by the time you get the money out there. So yeah, I'm excited. I think the SBA program will shine. I'm really proud of the SBA staff. I mean, these are government employees working, right long hours to to make it work so it was something that we'll be talking about for years to come that is for sure yeah i think um i mean and don't forget all the work from home stuff too with sba and and most of us in the lending community interestingly enough though only about half of the lenders that could make ppp loans actually made them you know we we have about 11 really thousand, yeah we have about oh 11, that's shocking thousand. yeah <laughs> well going into PPP, only about 1,700, 1,800 of all the lenders in America actually made an SBA loan in the preceding 12 months. So that's number one. Right. Number two, you had about 5,500 institutions make PPP loans in round one or round two. In round three, that was this year, um, that fell to about 50. But here's the problem. There's about 11,000 lending institutions in America. So yeah, about half of them did not participate for various reasons. I mean, I worked with several banks and credit unions that would refer their, their borrowers to us for PPP loans, which is great. And, and they, everybody had their reasons. A lot of times it was because they, they just weren't, they were going to stub their toes so badly, they just didn't want to even attempt. You know, they, they just knew to change their bank or their credit union so much, so radically in such a short period of time, they were probably going to make mistakes and they didn't want to take that reputational risk. That a lot of us did take actually, and we had, you know, right. everybody had problems with the rollout. So, but I think it's, um, I think it's probably going to go down as the economic story of this decade. I really do. I mean, I just never before has a government put almost a trillion dollars toward one sector of uh, of, of the economy, and it's uh, it's really remarkable, and it's radically different than what happened, you know, 10, 12 years ago, where as a nation, we propped up the largest corporations and the largest banks, oftentimes, you know, the same people that were the cause of, of the issues that we were going through back then. Um, you had a right. totally different view uh, this time around. It's, hey, you know, the large corporations probably have enough cash reserves. They can withstand this. A lot of their employees can work from home for a variety of different reasons. But we need to really focus our efforts on the small business community. Those are the most vulnerable, and and sure enough, they were they were right, and uh, I think it was the right thing to do. I, I know there's some there's been some academic papers written about 
you know, the job is saved and how much it really costs the American taxpayer to do this and whatnot. But, you know, I think it's easy to pick and choose and, and criticize, you know, kind of armchair quarterback this whole thing. But we didn't know how severe this was going to be at the time when it was launched. And, uh, you know, I really think this program, more importantly than anything, it stabilized the economy. Um, it could have gotten really bad. I was saying at the time, I mean, there could have been people with pitchforks and lanterns out in the streets if we hadn't done some of the things we did. And so, you know, you got to look at it holistically. Um, and that's where I think some of the, the academic, the researchers, the think tankers that are, that are criticizing now, I just think they're, they're, uh, they're taking too narrow of an approach. We can always yeah. find problems with things, but I think they need to take more of a global view of what occurred and, and the impact that it had. And, and um, I think everybody in the SBA lending community would probably agree that this was, this was a really profound thing that occurred that we were a part of and, uh, and we're better for it. It was. And as frontline people, you know, we got to talk with the business owners that understood this loan has to fund by Friday to make payroll or my staff doesn't get paid. And I don't know how many of your researchers out there actually dealt with that firsthand. Right. Um, Pretty sure they, did. they also didn't get the threats and the stalking and the, you know, all the other stuff that we dealt yeah. with. Well, it was messy that the first few weeks, I mean, month plus, I mean, you know, it was pretty clear from the press secretary room. I think I remember myself um, pretty distinctively, Secretary Mnuchin saying like, you can go to your bank on Friday and get one of these loans, like just go walk on in. And we're like, we're like, how do we do a yeah. PPP program? We're like propping it up overnight. So we have, you know, a line out the door of people coming to us for these loans. And we're in the middle of um, building the program and figuring things out for ourselves. So it was just uh, crazy. But, you know, and like you said, some of the banks did not participate. You guys helped pick up the slack on that. I think you were, what, the number six PPP lender in the country? This year. Yeah, we were the sixth. This year. Time. Well, there you go. So kudos to you. I want to just leave with one question for you, Chris. Sure. You know, you look back at all, all of your, you know, track record, your history, all your accomplishments, what, what stands out to you? Wow. I, I don't know. Nobody's asked me that before, Ray. Really? Um, is, it, is it this? <laughs> no. no. Because I have a, uh, this is an autographed, let's see what you wrote in here. Is that right? You wrote, yeah, because you wrote this book, The Entrepreneur's Secret to Creating Wealth. This was, must have been about, what, eight years ago? Yeah. yeah. Ray. Thanks for all your hard work. Keep at it. <laughs> well, there you Sign go. Chris. And I did. So all thank right. you. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, I got, I got another couple books in the works. One of them got mm. waylaid because of the pandemic, of course. Um, I find it very gratifying that what we do is not just for a paycheck. It's, it makes a profound difference in people's lives. Um, you know, whether it's helping them, uh, which is, which is basically the, the summary of the book in, in a couple sentences, you know, whether it's to help them create wealth for their business by owning the commercial real estate rather than paying their landlord the rent, um, or it's, you know, helping them acquire another business that, that dramatically enhances their margins and their, and their growth trajectory, or, you know, buying out a partner, um, you know, all these things, you know, make a huge difference. Um, to the lives of, of business owners, but, but even beyond them, to their families, to, to their employees and their families. I mean, it's, um, it's a big deal what we do. It's a great responsibility. And, um, and I'm glad that I, I sort of fell into the SBA space, you know, 20 some years ago. And uh, I hope that it's no longer thought of as a place in larger financial institutions where the, uh, you know, the oddballs go, you know, oh, go, you know, I, I, when I started this SBA lending in a lot of institutions was kind of like, you know, the, uh, the island of, of misfit toys, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I think we've all gotten a lot more respect, particularly what we've done over the last couple of years. Um, so that's good. I mean, uh, you know, I just, I want to continue to be able to help, um, the small business community, because that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm passionate about seeing people succeed 
because if they succeed, if they increase prosperity for themselves, it, it really is a tide that lifts all boats. Um, and we wouldn't have the, the lifestyle we have as Americans if, if, we, if it weren't for entrepreneurs and their innovations, their breakthroughs, and the people that are behind them that help finance them. It's a, it's a really important role that we play. And so, you know, my legacy, I don't know. I, I want to try and help as many as I can, uh, continue to grow the business, um, you know, cr to continue to be a, play a small, small role and, uh, you know, good people like yourself going off and, and also doing this. I think that's important. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I still feel like I'm going to do this for a long time. I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just hitting my stride right now. It took mm. 20 years, but I feel like I'm just hitting my stride now. Well, you, you took a vision, you turned it into a company, you hired people, you created jobs, you help other businesses create jobs, and you'll, you're leaving a, a big uh, mark on this industry. So that is that is huge Appreciate accomplishment. It. So thank, thanks for coming on, Chris. I really thank enjoyed you. talking with you today. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. Enjoy it. All right. See ya.